Hello, a very good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Today. Today, I'm Chamberlain Oso. My favorite day of the week. How oh, I love to see Fridays. <laughs> good morning and welcome. I'm Maupe Oguyusu. <laughs> and I'm Fadi Tewo's favorite day of the week. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ayo Makinde. Today is October the 4th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, October the 4th. Welcome to the show. Well, if it's your favorite day of the week, you might as well make the most of it while you can. For some people, this will be their favorite part when they go to this site, this dam. It has this relaxing feeling. So, yeah, it's recommended. Oh, maybe uh, Sunrise Daily recommended, <laughs> no doctor recommendation. <laughs> so, you should have uh, some lovely sights and sounds where go to a serene place where you could actually take a moment or two to think. So, so many things happening so thick and fast, I tell you. So, uh, but, um, oh, I thought it's uh, a little more relaxing area, but. Um... <laughs> what do you mean by that? I can tell you that uh, the people of Zamfara State will not smile at that statement. What do you mean by you thought it was a more relaxing area? <laughs> well, you know, uh, there are dams, I mean, some lovely sights and sounds that we do have previously, which is where you go for, for where tourists can go both for here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I think it, it will be worthwhile to have a, a conversation with the governor of Zamfara State, Governor Dauda Lawal, who interestingly was in um, uh, at Onga recently um, at the United Nations General Assembly, you know, trying to, you know, make a case for his state, alongside a number of other governors who were also there as well. But, yes, the view you're seeing here is the Bakalori Dam in, uh, located in Zamfara State. I'm trying to see the local government area a little more clo closely. It's in the Maradun local government area, as you can see on the screen right there. And it's supposed to be one of those, you know, helping to... Uh, supply electricity and also help with irrigation in Zamfara State. But I, I, I don't know, I'm, it's unclear when this was taken. I, I don't think this was uh, right in the peak of the rainy season because I would think that if there was, we should be seeing a little more green around that area. Um, Zamfara recently, unfortunately, has come under, has been in the news for not the most pleasant reasons, but Let's not forget what the state is capable of. As Timberling always says, we don't eat potential. But, you know, <laughs> it, it is important that we know that the potential is there. I mean, a state that is so richly blessed with so many resources, one of which is land. And now we also see it's capable of storing water uh, for irrigation and for agriculture um and and for electricity production there is so much there but it would seem that all that has uh, come on that focus is the gold in zampra which has now caused a lot of conflict in that state uh it will be very interesting to see what the attempts at resolutions to ensure that the full potential of this state is harnessed uh, i think that's certainly a conversation and the, I interestingly the governor uh, the current governor has been very vocal about what is happening in his state or what has happened in the past, implicating the uh, former governor, the immediate past governor of the state, who is now Minister of State for Defense. Interestingly, Chimbling, you also had a conversation uh, with the former, with the current Minister of State for Defense, yeah. you know, who also had a lot to say. But this is what we're looking at. I don't know how it is. I'm looking at this dam and I'm telling you all of this story. <laughs> But the idea, and also let's not forget that dams have also come under scrutiny in recent times, given what has happened with the dam in uh, Meiduguri, which broke and caused a disaster, a major disaster to the people of that city. So it is important, as the Minister of Water Resources has said, that they look at all of the dams and make sure that their integrity is not in doubt this dam, the one in Abuja, the one in Niger State, all of the dams, the many dams that we have across the uh, many states of this country, to be sure that, you know, we're not looking at disasters waiting to happen. Uh, but I would say that this is a rather swimming view if you were to take a rather objective view of what you're seeing on your screen. Ayo, what would you say? Tension. 
I, they, I, I think I can relate to what Chamberlain was talking about when he said, I thought it was a more relaxing view. Remember that dam that, you know, we also have, that we have brought yeah. on a number of times. That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> you too. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe that's what he had in mind, and maybe what you are saying, Malfoy, is that the potential is here at Bacalori Dam to do exactly the same thing there. And you know what is interesting? I'm now right you now. Get it. Yes, I'm right now on the website of the ICRC, that's the Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission, and guess what the value of IC of this Bacalori Dam is according to that website. 816.8 million naira. That's about 5.06 million dollars. Well, it could be more now. I don't know, but that's what is is, is stated. And we also understand that um, it's under the, of course, the Federal Ministry of Power, Works and Housing at the time, because that has been since restructured now, and it's under the energy sector. Quite a number of interesting things you will find about Bakalori Dam on that particular page that I'm looking at now. So the potential is there. Are we going to turn it around and make the most of it for our people? I guess that's what we're to see. Oh. Yeah, so there's another interesting development that came through not long ago. The VIO, or what do they call themselves, the DRTS, here's for you. The court, Federal High Court has now recently ruled that you cannot impose fines, harass, impound vehicles of motorists and then force them to do all those things that you always do. Just as it is only a competent court that can perform all of those functions. If you think they have been found guilty of anything, they have to be at the court where those things can be done. So now I know some of you might have seen this kind of visuals before. Where officials in maybe Directorate of Road Traffic Services and Vehicle Inspection Officers do all these kind of things, confiscating or imposing fines on motorists, even jumping into vehicles, maybe you're driving on the road, they jump into your vehicle and force you to drive somewhere, or you say, let me see your driving li your license, they, then they seize it, or let me see your, your papers or your document, then they hold on to it and force you to say no. You must go and do this. But now, the judge has ruled on this. Justice Nkiri Maha held that no law empowered the VIO to stop, impound, confiscate, seize, or impose fines on motorists for any form of violation. Any form of violation. So all they've been doing all the while, they've been the judge and the jury. And that goes against the principle of natural justice. Can you be a judge in your own matter? Which is what we've seen a lot of times. So, so it, it's something that several persons in, just give them small uniform in this country. Oh my God. I said they'd be waiting for it all their lives. So it's very clear now, if they do this on any road whatsoever, motorists will have, they have a right to resist an unlawful law or what do they call it? Unlawful directive. <laughs> so, um, I hope they have not gone to look for a judge's trouble. <laughs> 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 because the comprehensive nature <laughs> of this judgment <laughs> suggests to me <laughs> that BIO has gone to bite off what I think. a public true. interest lawyer, Mr. <laughs> Abubakar Mashal. Well done, Mr. Mashal. You, you need great. People are praying for you right now. You have no idea. <laughs> I think I'm about to laugh like this. Absolutely. <laughs> so the VIO has no love. <laughs> no, they don't. But, but you know, the thing is, they're only on a revenue drive. That's what they do. That's exactly. They only target the vehicles they know will pay. <laughs> look at cars that are dilapidated. They just look the other way. They just oh, okay, please leave this. This one's will never be bought for this. They just hold you. Once they know you can't, then they hold on to you. So now they say, no, whatever, you go and find other ways of doing it, but you cannot be stopping vehicles on the road. If their papers expire, let them charge them to court. No love from the Sunrise Daily crew, VIO. <laughs> you guys have not been doing great. <laughs> no, we don't have well, love for the who truth, violate the law. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, ever since I learned that these officials, you can't win with them. I just said, look, anything that would put me in conflict, in contact, in negation, I just, you know, I arrange myself 
I, every year I think my papers, are they in order? Because the one thing I do not want, they would derail you. They would annoy you. They would rile you. They are the only groups of people on the road. Even the police, the police is far more reasonable yeah. than VIO. These guys officials. act like principalities. Uh, they, <laughs> that's who they act like. So <laughs> I have always found with the moment any VIO, and you know what? They always find the most innocuous, the most annoying days, the days when you are rushing somewhere, the days, I mean, yesterday, just two days ago, what am I saying? Yeah, two days ago. Two days ago, I was rushing off somewhere, rushing. I was actually in a hurry and I could see the lights. Mm -hmm. I was right just before a traffic light. The light was green. And here I was trying to say, ah, let me see, hurry up, you know, before the lights turn red. And then this, I just saw these officials from nowhere. I tried to stop me at the <laughs> green light. Ah. And I was, I yeah, was pointing at the light. Are you looking at the light? It's about to turn red, this man. Well, uh, by the time, you know, he slowed me down and slowed me down. And before I know what's happening, the light turned right. And I was just like, oh, this guy, did they get it? Well, did they get it at all? Anyway, so as I said, I mean, the question is, now that this law has now, I would like to say this uh, judgment has now been handed down. The question yeah. is, would they see it? Because... I was, looking, I was looking at the reactions on Twitter yesterday, and I saw this very prominent one from Dr. Joe Abba. Uh, if you remember him, if you know him, he, he was the Director General of the Bureau for Public Service Reforms. He did a great job with the FRSC, and at least I think a lot of people have wonderful things to say about the Federal Road Safety Corps in terms of at least the, the speed with which you can get your driver's license these days. So... Dr. Joe Abba was reacting yesterday and he says, they will say they haven't seen the ruling. Anyone that has it should share it so that everyone can <clears> print <throat> it and keep it in their cars. I fought them when I was DG and even showed them a memo from their minister that they shouldn't be on the roads during Whoa. rush hour. I know really? them well. So yes, that, is, that was his response. I mean, to this particular judgment that in Abuja here, you're not supposed to stop cars during rush hour, when people are going to work, rushing off to work, or when they're closing from work, because you impede traffic, you cause unnecessary holdup, and all of that. And, and in that period, it seemed that they, they were not listening. They were going against that, and he says that he had cause to engage with them, and they said they've not seen it. So he's saying that, please, this judgment has to be widely circulated. <laughs> Vehicle owners should have copies of it. Whenever it is they stop you, you say, no, you do not have a right to be here. And here's the judgment saying you should not be here. Ignorance yeah. of the law is no excuse. <laughs> Please. Not too many in uniform. You must have... They are, they are chief of, of this. Ignorance of the law. Not too many Law enforcement is not a law breaker. So it will be don't, interesting don't, don't, don't to see just how this you know, is implemented. But Ayo, I don't know what your experience has been with VIO. Of course Ayo is happy Maybe about this Maybe has some love for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Abuja here. <laughs> well, Chile, you know, you already, you, you already made the declaration on, our part, on behalf of of the team no love and, and not because uh, no, not because we hate it's just because you know your antecedents always precede you and it's not just a good one however i think um, maybe there's something that is instructive uh, chamberlain in the in the story that you read that there is no law that empowers them will this now compel someone to go create a law that will now empower them and I think, you know, maybe it might be a good idea for someone to begin to think about some initiatives. Lagos used to do that as well until, of course, you know, uh, there has been some improvement now, so to speak. But maybe the, another upside to this, Chamberlain, is the fact of the man that you, whose name you called who took this matter to court. Let us test our laws. Let us test our systems. Let us test our judiciary. Let us test the system to check whether or not they work for us. Now, the people who have been wronged by VIO in various parts of the country, now this is a headline. Will this judgment also apply in Zamfara or Kebi or Borono or Kaduna or anywhere else? I guess time will tell, but this is what is operational now. And it's a good thing for, let them also now learn. And please, should there be those who are not educated among them? 
Let them take them to school and teach them the letters of that pronouncement of the court. That's my take, Chamberlain. Oh, by the way, uh, let's take you through some of the dailies here. Prominent on the front pages this morning is the address of the president to bandits. Look at the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. Tinubu to terrorists, bandits, surrender of face, renewed military onslaught. Stories on page 26. Poverty, unemployment, contributory causes of insecurity in the Sahel. That's according to Abdul Salami. Multidimensional approach needed to address insecurity. That's from the CDS. Same story is repeated right there on the front page of the Leadership Friday. Drop arms or be killed, Tinubu warns terrorists. Poverty, failed institutions created fertile ground for insecurity. That's from Abu Salami. Sahel region synonymous to instabilities from CDS. ECOWAS to activate 5,000 men force to fight terrorists. Nigeria winning the war, says FG. Same story on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct. Enough is enough. Your time is up. Tinubu tells terrorists, bandits, Sahel is still a huge killing field despite successful government efforts. That story is on page 21 of the Nigerian News Direct this morning. The angle of this Nigerian newspaper to that same story is 7,260 persons killed by bandits in two years. Ex-head of state Abdul Salami Abubakar laments evil of insecurity in the north. Find the details of that story on the inside pages. Page 6 to be precise. The front page of Daily Times has that same story from this angle. Insecurity. CDS Musa kicks against hiring of military contractors. Says hiring military contractors will aggravate insecurity in Nigeria. Lists reasons why fight against terrorists, bandits has dragged for years. That story has details on page four. If you look at the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, this is what you have. Minimum wage, disquiet as FG makes selective payments. Labor leaders kick, say government insensitive to suffering of workers. Workers lament hardship, many sleep in offices, strike to work due to high transport costs. Delay affecting productivity, that's from NAT. Varsity workers, worst hit. That's coming from Sano. The details of that story you find on page 5 of the paper this morning. The Guardian has lured by passion, imperiled by political class, broken system. The details you find on the inside pages, but of course, the infographic on the front page will give you an idea of what's to come. Daily Trust has FG targets more revenue from taxes as Tinubu sends four bills to National Assembly to rename FIRS, harmonize states' LG's levies, capture cryptocurrency. Government looking for more money. As from an economist, find out who said that on page 4 of the Daily Trust newspaper. Daily Independent has varsities on verge of shutting down over hardship. Asu Lamins says most universities pay 300 million naira for electricity monthly. Government only gives a paltry 50 million for overhead monthly. ASUP gives FG two weeks over pending demands. Find the details on page 29 of the paper today. That same story is captured this way on the front page of New Telegraph. High electricity bills. Varsities on verge of shutting down as from ASU decry foreign elites influence on Nigerian politics. Polytechnic lecturers may withdraw services, cite unresolved demands. Issue 15-day ultimatum to FG, mobilize members for protests. Despite challenges, teachers' welfare remains priority. That's coming from the federal government. Cost of electricity will soon come down. That's a promise from the power minister. Find the details on the inside pages of the paper today. Business Day has multinationals exit Nigerian operations to limit FX exposure. What does that mean? Retain local assets to tap opportunities. The details of that story you have on the front page and it continues on the inside pages of the paper. And these are the papers we have for you today.
All right, welcome back to Sunrise City. Well, earlier this morning, uh, we just saw the, we heard the governor of River State um, where he was talking about how some policemen were trying to cut away election materials. I mean, we played that moment ago. And then he tried to, well, he did use some very strong words for the judgment that was handed down, called them fraudulent. And then he also did say, uh, use some strong words for the IGP as well. Uh, but at the moment, there seems to be some real palpable tension in rivers ahead of the elections that are supposed to hold tomorrow. Uh, I use that because, I mean, a different perspective on those matters. We've got Mr. John Lee, the legal practitioner, joining us now. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. Now, there are different things happening so quick and fast, uh, as I was trying to just lay that background, because earlier... Different groups holding on to different judgments in court, saying elections, local government elections cannot hold. Some say, nope, it will hold. And then the narrative about the register. Then this morning, the governor was saying, look, well, what do we need the register for? And then Tom said, there was no, even if we spoke about the register, it did not preclude, he didn't say, stop the elections. And so this morning, different groups are digging their heels in with their boys or thugs, as it were, trying to of course, enforce whatever it is that they are, whoever it is telling them to do what. So from your perspective, the law, the law appears to be, do I say the law appears to be on trial here? Because different judgments have been handed down and people are saying, no, this is fraudulent. We can't obey this one. We will obey this, interpreting it in their own way, even with lawyers advising them as such. So tell us, what do you think can, because if elections hold tomorrow, Will they say it's legal? Will some people say, wouldn't they say it's in violation of the earlier judgments? Where do we go from here? Good morning, Chamberlain, and good morning to the old Channel TV family. Thanks for having me. Um, we're, we're at another crossroads in respect of River State. Over the years, I've had the opportunity given by channels to comment on River State issues, political issues, Every time since 1999, there has never been peaceful transition. There's always somebody fighting another over issues, the most basic issue of life in Nigeria today, voting. It is very sad that I belong to an industry that's actually being used or allowing itself to be used to trample upon the desires of the population. You cannot begin to explain how different courts, I mean, this is something that's been happening over time. There will be an order handed down by the Federal High Court. The State High Court will give its own order. There are very clear distinctions. You know which court has jurisdiction. You know which court has no jurisdiction. And yet, the same Federal High Court exists in River State, in Port Harcourt there, where you can get whatever orders or whatever kind of justice you want, presumably good ones. But yet, people will go to Federal High Court Abuja to go and get their orders. The people in the Port Court will go to the State High Court in, in River State to get their own orders in respect of one election. Definitely, somebody is misinterpreting the law. I have always said it. The law is very clear. We all know, most lawyers are assumed, I mean, it will be very sad for me to say uh, some lawyers know the law. A lawyer is presumed to know the law. And that's why other people go to come to us to explain to them their rights. Now, when a lawyer, a high, I mean, a, a, a very, very high-ranking member of the bar goes to court to ask court for orders that he knows the court has no jurisdiction to give, it is sad. And when a, when, uh, a lawyer goes to court to, to get an order that he knows will truncate the advancement of democratic tenets. It is very sad. But unfortunately, the courts will not sanction anybody. The disciplinary court bodies will not sanction anybody because the rule of law in Nigeria is not the same as for everybody. Now, this river state say, look at it. They say Justice Lee who gave an order that says no elections. Justice Igwe in river state gave an order that says the elections must go on willy-nilly. INEC says, I, I have not released the voters' register that will be used to conduct these elections. The River State Independent Electoral Commission says, 
No, you are lying. We, I mean, we can go on with this. Then there's another story that says 17 out of 18 parties have subscribed. They said they want to go on with the election. And which party is saying, no, we are not going on? According to reports, PDP. Fubara says, I'm still PDP. And the elections are going on. So he declares two days of public holiday so that people can travel to the interland to vote in these elections that is scheduled to hold on tomorrow. And this morning we heard that some policemen tried to impound electoral uh, materials. And then another court uh, issues from 48 that if you do not comply with my order, I think that's the high court, you are liable for contempt. Now, we, we all must ask ourselves, every time in the report we hear pro Wiki, pro Fubara, pro INEC, pro uh, Abuja, pro APC, pro PDP, who is pro River State people? Nobody is working to advance the interests of the people. It is about personal interests. The law is as clear as day after night. It is the personality clashes. It is the uh, ego, ego issues personal vendetta of the actors in the political sector that is putting the interest of River State in jeopardy. I dare say that all these things are mere shenanigans and it is better that something gets done. Somebody must go above the fray. Somebody must come up. It may be, I mean, this is should be exclusively a state thing. They are quoting a Supreme Court judgment that says, oh, by October 15th, there should be no uh, ad hoc committees in charge of local government. You and I know that the reason why they, I mean, the the uh, the governor is interested in conducting the election is so as he can put his own. I'm sorry to say, but he wants to be in control. He wants to have full control. Anybody in control of the local government is in control of the state, and the people who are fighting him, they don't want the elections now because they are not ready. They, they I mean, the machinery they need to put in place to ensure that they seize control of the local government. They are not yet in place. It took a lot to displace the former chairman, that is the new governor, to get them out of the place. Now he wants to put his own people there. The truth must be told. This is not about River State. Somebody, uh, uh, this morning, I was uh, I saw another uh, a, a post, a video uh, post, by somebody in River State saying, oh, as of last night, some people were trying to file an application before the federal high court in uh, Rivers and Abuja to, to get an order withholding the allocation, the revenue allocation to River State. Why? So that the governor cannot continue to work unless and until he's ready to beg. Now, how will that advance the cost of Rivers and its people? Uh, Chamberlain, truth must be told, Nigeria is at crossroads. It is not about rivers. It's just it's just an example of what is going on everywhere else. I mean, it is not about performance anymore. It is about holding the jugular of where you are, your own corner of the Nigerian society, and ensuring that you have a kingdom there. This is about kingdom seizure. Okay. And I dare say it, the river state people will suffer. Pardon, the if if I could just ask you, because there were yeah. persons too who were also trying to tell us that wait a minute, you people. Were, missed out that there's a, there's an i think he said they an app a decision against app leadership saying no some people came into app at the last minute and then you want to impose them and say they are the candidates that no they're supposed to be the people who are said to be the local government chairman so when did they become app flag bearer and then they say look and by the way the foundation was that the supreme court has said no local government you can't have Ketika committee. And so if you do that, you don't get any funds. And so they thought that was the crux of the matter. But if we say, for instance, assuming these elections go on on Saturday, will all the cases that have been filed, what then becomes of the position of the law if this election go on? It's a, it's a catch-22 scenario. You have a situation where elections are, are being, I mean, even if the elections go on tomorrow, you all know that, you see, it's, there's a banana peel already. And it's a political gimmick. It's something our politicians have learned how to use well over the years. It means the elections are already in jeopardy. I mean, if it goes on, it depends on who controls or who has better access to, to, to the judiciary. 
And that's what that that's what I mean. A lot of people say, oh, this is the elections in Nigeria, they are not won and lost at the polling polling centers. They are won and lost at the counting centers. But you see, the politicians have even taken it, it a step further. You don't win and lose even at the counting centers. They prepare the banana peel. Long you, you, you hear of pre-election matters, post-election matters. And then there, I mean the courts have not helped. The, the, the laws regulating, I mean, the judicial pronouncement on election elections in Nigeria, you cannot say, I mean, they, they, they remain in a state of flux because it depends on who is approaching the court. You have a situation where a particular uh, governorship election, they will say, oh, the, this person has won. I don't want to name them because we are talking about rivers. But you know as well as I do that there are certain judgments that they have even said is not going to be a precedent to be followed. Is for this specific purpose alone. So now you have after contesting election, spending money, the river state, river state people's money, after it's been spent, they will then go back to court. Then there will be a conflict of laws, as we say in law practice. What do I mean? This one will bring a judgment of the federal high court. That one will bring a judgment of the state high court. That one will be the one from Abuja, the one from River State. And then it will get to court, uh, court of Appeal. And then the Court of Appeal will then begin to say, oh, which one is superior? Because that's the way we should look at it. Which one, the, the, it used to be, which one was first in time? Or which one was later? You know, when I enter law practice, they will say, oh, the latest judgment of the Supreme Court, for instance, is, is the one you follow, where there are two conflicting decisions of the Supreme Court. That used to be the law. But now, different panels of all these courts will choose the one they like. They will, that's when they will say, oh, this one was first in time. And the, uh, the next, the, uh, the order that came after it ought not to have, I mean, been pronounced because there was one. If that court had adapted its mind to the existence of that, to, to a subsisting order, it would not have made this order. And then we begin to do the, we begin to play the board game, chess, of, okay, we eliminate this, we eliminate that. At that point, there is room for the judiciary to maneuver, to favor whoever it wants to favor. It's about discretion. It's no longer about law. So, like you have said, all these rulings, all these orders, all these judgments, they are the banana peels, the catch-22. When the chips are down and it gets to Supreme Court, there is going to be a lot of conflict. And then the Supreme Court that can never be wrong in Nigeria, we then choose the one that that i mean that uh is in sync with the desires of the winning party and at that point the winning party will say oh this is this is what justice means different interpretations for justice oh the judiciary is their last look of the common man the losing party will say oh the judiciary is corrupt that is the situation we have now it is time for the judiciary to redeem itself the the the, the organ of government that will save Nigeria from this precipice is the judiciary. At some point in time, the judiciary must begin to tell the politicians, no, you cannot come to us to put our imprimatur on that which is palpably bad. We are not going to sanction all this your all, all these your moves that you do in anticipation of a favorable decision at the apex court. It has to stop. Some of these cases ought not to even get to the Supreme Court. Some of us lawyers who who practice otherwise than as election law practitioners, our cases are not being heard. Because every election cycle, they'll say, oh, uh, the, the, it, there's a time bar. We have to finish all the election petitions. Now, they finish presidential governorship, a local government, they, they have started their own. And they will find a way, we lawyers, we find a way to push these matters up to Supreme Court, thereby disturbing those of us who do not live on election petitions alone. I must say that. So it is very sad. All these things that are happening, they are just preparation for the final tango at the apex court. And it is very sad. And I believe that, well, we thank God for the new CJN. I believe that she's well enabled to begin to need all this nonsense in the board. It has got to stop. We are, we are being mocked. The legal practice, the judiciary in Nigeria, nobody respects anything again. You get an order from a court, even in relation to, uh, what's it called, divorce. And you find, you, I mean, 
embassies will scrutinize it. They will even tell you. They overrule our judges now. When you present a document, a court order, to embassies, they will tell you that, I, I, I mean, they are not even certain it's genuine, even when it is genuine. And then when they go back there to check, they will tell you that, okay, we have checked. But, we are, I mean, why? I, I, am, I, I witness a judge saying, how can an embassy official teach me my job? Is it not sad? So that is it. It's a banana peel. And they are putting things in place. They are putting things in. The midfielders are playing now. It's, it's a game of soccer now. The midfielder, the, the, the holding midfielder, the attacking midfielder, they are all there now, ready. And then the avalanche of cases will start. Mm. <clears throat> Which is really, really, really sad, as you've said. And uh, apparently, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, the new Chief Justice, Kudurat Kekereko, uh, now has her work clearly cut out for her. But I, I want to, you know, at the heart of it, you said this is about kingdom seizure. That's what you said. And I, really, some people will say it's because the local, we all know the outcome of local government elections. Uh, it has not changed. Since we have started seeing the conduct of local government elections, especially in the wake of this uh, declaration of autonomy for local governments, we've seen that every single state uh, that has conducted elections, the party of the governor in that state has taken all the seats. And, and we know that that has always been the status quo with regards to the country. So it would seem that, you know, the, 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 the quest here or the battle here is to ensure that that doesn't happen in River State. Isn't that exactly, isn't that swimming against the tide? Because we, we know, uh, not because people love the, the ruling party in any state, even in, this, in the states that, you know, the, their governors seem to be professing democracy. Uh, you always find that even when they too conduct elections in their state, almost all the seats are swept away by the party of the governor. And they say, well, is, is, we won. We won. They always claim that they won. And sometimes you find that the opposing party never contests. I mean, they, they don't even participate in elections because they don't trust in the process. So isn't that what we're witnessing here? Isn't that what has really gotten to a head here in River State where we're witnessing this? And is there any way we can correct that? Uh, if we're able to correct that, will we have a situation like this in Rivers? Malcolm, okay, thank you. I mean, you just, you, you got it right. I mean, you, I, I always tell people, the Nigerian problem is not about law or its application. It's about we as a people. It's about, it's about the, 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 the elites, the political class, believing that, look, democracy has a Nigerian definition. You see, the, the Nigerian politician does not practice democracy as obtained in most other places. I'm not saying democracy is 100%. It's perfect. It's never perfect anywhere. I mean, there are ways and means of ensuring that you sway people to the side of the... I mean, the ruling party always wants to win. I mean, we see America gerrymandering, all those things. They do all these things. But you see, the Nigerian situation is very peculiar. The politicians have gotten away with murder all the time. They have found a way to corrupt the legislative houses. They have found, I mean, I mean, I mean, this river state situation is, is just is just out of this world. I mean, you have a situation where a, a whole a whole legislative house was demolished because there was a fight between the governor and I mean I looked at it, you demolish an edifice that had been standing prior before you were born because you didn't want me to see. The same thing is happening. The average politician, you see a situation where, yes, the government of the day is not performing. It's below par, it's below zero. And then in the next election, local government election or whatever election, runoff election, they win 100% of the votes. How do you begin to explain that? But then, the government at the center now is winning here and there. And then there's a state, because the state matters. This is not just about Revenue allocation. It's also about 2027. The, the, the government in power cannot broach any opposition from River State because River State is a very sensitive hotbed. And in order to win, River State is, I mean, is the is the uh, is the golden fish. So yes, it may it may appear like it's it's I mean swim so the people are swimming against the tide. But like I always say. The people in Abuja, the people in government housing rivers, they won't be on the streets, rigging, fighting, manipulating election results. 
They use people like you and I to do all these things. And they are always susceptible. You know, what happens to just vote, coming out to vote? I mean, right now, what, what is going to happen is voter apathy. The politicians know what they are doing. People will not come out because they will be afraid of violence. When they don't come out, they are told to come out. They will fight. Some people will die. In the presidential and governorship election, you remember a lot of people died in River State. Who has been prosecuted? Who has been sanctioned? Nobody. There is never any sanction after the event in Nigeria. It depends on where you belong after the action. Even if you kill people and you go to the, you jump into the winning party, automatically you are sanction free. So right now, the fight for rivers is not just about revenue. It is also about 2027. The person in control of rivers must belong to a particular party. So both sides are swimming against the tide. Unfortunately, the people are going to just stand arms akimbo. They are going to be watching. They are, we, are, we are getting to a situation where in future, Nigerians won't even be coming out to vote anymore. The voter party is terrible. Wow. People like mm -hmm. myself, I've, I've always I've always voted. I've almost made up my mind now that voting, I mean, a lot of people will tell me that, why are you wasting your time? Some still tell me now, I, I, when they tell me, hey, all the votes, go, 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 tell the, what, what, what happened? Where, where did it go? And I will tell them, the votes that you did not vote, see where it has led us. <laughs> and, 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 and God help you. I, I mean, many of us who are talking, who talk every day on TV, that we even have an opportunity to talk to you on TV says that we are we are mostly comfortable. We are not hungry. Do you understand? We keep on talking and talking. We are even getting tired of talking. Do you understand? Because I am okay. During Buhari era, I mean, I was blessed. Tinubu era, I am being blessed. The people who keep coming to you for help, they will go out again and vote, and they will call you a bastard for not voting for your kingsman. It is very sad. We are in a very pathetic state. But yes, all of us are swimming against the tide. But I tell you this, the day the Nigerian judiciary begins, and I tell you this also, Justice Kekere, Kukudra Kekere, is somebody that we all respect. Not because she's a woman, not because she's cerebral, but because we, we know she's upright. And I believe that she might just be the beginning of a new beginning for this country. By the grace of God, if she handles the judiciary well, I hate to say by the grace of God, because I always tell people, Nigeria's problem is not from God. It's not of God. And for as long as we keep praying and praying and praying, people do not with that. It's not going to help us. We need to take the destiny of this country in our hands. Oh. And let us just hope that Justice K. K. will begin to clean up the judiciary such that when judges issue uh, the permanent kind of orders, overnight orders, she will rise up to the occasion and sanction anybody who ought to be sanctioned. And when lawyers also bring such applications, I mean, if a judge is sanctioned, other judges will know that when lawyers bring useless applications before them, they must treat the lawyer like a useless person. Yeah, I think that's what uh, a lot of people will be looking to see. So for this particular case, they will wait to watch and see will the judiciary be strong on the weak and weak on the strong. So I guess time will tell. Well, we do thank you for your time as always, uh, Mr. John Lady. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, things are developing real quick and fast in reverse. I understand the governor is uh, about now having a press conference, talking to the media about it. And so you could expect that, of course, if he finishes, you have another group who also want to respond to what he has said. And so puts the media also in a bind because they will need to also be careful. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that the, the, the laws that the media are praised by is yeah. also violated? Indeed. So all of those things, Balance, even though the people want to hearing. see, yeah. they want to know what's going on. So um, equally catch 22 for the media, I mm -hmm. tell you. Well, it's also going to be interesting to see the role that security agencies will play. Because oh. right now the governor is saying that, um, you know, they don't need the police in the state. Uh, the question they don't need is, the police? Yeah, they don't need the police. So the question is, it's gonna uh, be, who's going to, you know, ensure we'll talk, that... We'll talks take over the state. And security in the state. How are we going to... Well, because they believe that the police has been compromised. They believe that the police is not... It's taking sides in this conflict. I think well, the police will have to show uh, that they are not taking sides and they have 
no reason because they're the only state actor recognized, so recognized to be able to provide so the, security. The thing is this, what they always tell us, the law is the law. Mm -hmm. The law is not about emotions. If, fortunately, the police is the legal entity to do some of these things, any non-state actor mm -hmm. that comes in there, they'll tell you, who, who, who clears, who licenses those non-state actors? It's the police. Mm -hmm. So, so, but if the police uh, were, know, you know, some officials were caught yesterday, or from what we then deal with that, those ones. You know, whoever is caught, then let them face the music. But the thing is this: who is the commissioner of police in Rivers? We understand that's supposed to change. Mm. So who will the person be? I don't know. This these things are a little tricky. But um, we'll have to uh, head over now to Lagos. I just got our next guest with him. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. You know that question that you're asking: who? It's another question that's been asked. Who will police the police? Now, there's also been that talk in some quarters that, you know, maybe we need to begin to police ourselves. Uh, you know, everyone bear arms and all of those things. God forbid that those days come. But, you know, let's have a conversation this morning because in a way it's kind of related. Honorable Adejo Radio joins us this morning uh, to have this conversation because the Senate stepped down a bill for the act, an act to prescribed standard and conditions of license for operation and practice of private investigators in Nigeria. What that all of what all of that is about, let's hear from Honorable Adi Joradiogun, former Deputy Chairman, House Committee on National Security and Intelligence. Thanks for joining us this morning, Honorable. Oh well I guess we're gonna get him uh, back uh, as soon as we, we do have him we'll let you know. So the, the exa essentially what the whole issue is about is that the Senate halted the progress of that bill aimed at uh, regulating private investigators. That, that bill was sponsored by Senator Ositangu who sought to establish uh, licensing standards and conditions for private investigation practices. His argument is that the bill would help regulate private investigators offering investigative support to law enforcement as seen in other countries like the US, UK and all of that. Of course, uh, the bill uh, faced opposition, strong opposition from several lawmakers, uh, including Senator Shomali and a number of others. Honorable, are you with us now? Yes, I am. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. So, Help us understand what exactly, you know, this bill is about and all of the things that, that have gone ahead of it. I mean, he, having chaired the deputy chair, the House Committee on National Security and Intelligence, what's the implication of this development? Um, thank you once more for having me. My understanding of this bill is just an act to regulate the private security industry and um, put them under some kind of control. We were not sure what happened within the Senate because uh, when you have a bill, it's not enough to get a bill to the floor, especially when it's undergoing second reading. Do you have to do due diligence? You have to lobby your colleagues. You have to reach out to them days before the presentation. I am not sure if Senator um, Wood did that, so that could have been the reason he faced so much opposition. Aside that, um, I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, Nigeria needs that um, the bill. We need a law to regulate the private security and the private investigation industry. We'll be deceiving ourselves thinking that they don't exist. They exist in Nigeria pretty legally without any form of regulation. Uh, then I think it would be in the interest of um, national security and, of course, uh, and the entire Nigerian see if we can put them under some form of a regulatory control. The question, well, one of the questions to ask would be do you think we are ripe? for that now? Are we developed enough for it? You see, we all have them operating in Nigeria. So are we right? You know, it's like, you know, they're already operating what I call the black economy. So we'll be pretending that they don't exist. But if they do exist, then we should regulate. Right now, they operate without any license, without any form of regulation. So I think for some reason, we should bring them under strict control. So how about that argument that some senators or some lawmakers believe that um, it could be uh, used for political blackmail and extortion? You do not need um, private investigators to embark on political blackmail. People go do blackmail every day. You're seeing that on social media every day, so you just don't require private investigators to do that. 
But the reality is, if we really want to have a society where we create jobs, who um, legitimize, you know, things that happen in the black economy, we have to look at the merit of whatever bill is brought before the National Assembly. I think what they should have done is looked at the merits beyond the political side of it. Because right now, you can hire private investigators to do any kind of investigation, and they will operate without any license, without any control, without anybody regulating that. In countries where private investigators operate, they have rules, especially on data protection. Um, they have rules restricting their ability to operate because they, they, you know, there's a narrow gap for them. They involve in investigations, in missing persons investigation, by in background checks and things like that. They're not involved in criminal investigation unless they're doing it um, to support the police. Otherwise, they're supposed to deal strictly on issues that are civil in nature. Mm. The, one of the concerns could be whether or not they would bear arms. Private investigators don't have to bear arms. I mean, I did say that all they, they only restrict to civil cases. And where they have um, not, I'll call it non-violent criminal cases, which would be in cases like fraud, like uh, missing persons, like kidnapping and things like that, if they're involved in it, they're doing it to complement the job of the police, not to do it independently because they can't prosecute. They don't have any power to prosecute and they don't have the power of arrest. Hmm. All right, well, Honorable, just, just give us a moment to take a message or two. We'll be right back. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable healthcare for all the family at all times. fun but as a mom i see how demanding it can be for my child that's why i ensure he starts every day with a cup of bone vita bone vita prepare them to win every day now all of us like to chop better food food where they make body tranga and vegetables were fresh like see tomorrow not day we want to make the chocolate sweet the way we could like out no cubes let me be the secret then make them with correct ingredients like chicken, parsley, garlic, plenty iron, corn full and palm to make your chocolate palm bar for you. Come the sweet well well. Time with the cocoa. Make we carry salute. Throw away give no. Change your world by changing waiting day your plate. Thank you for staying with us. We're having a conversation with Honorable Adujara Diogun on the bill that's been uh, stepped down in the, in the National Assembly Senate to regulate private investigators in the country. Now, Honorable, one of the issues that a number of people want to ask is, look, how does it help? I mean, you say it's a good thing you should have been, you know, taken to the next level, but really, how does that help or harm? How does it interfere with the work of the police in Nigeria? It does not interfere the work of the police. It's meant to complement what the police does. You see, now there's so many cases in which the police is um, involved in civil investigations, civil issues that ordinarily private investigators can take off them. So that's where it will help. And then let's look at it even from the economic perspective. We need to create jobs for people who have you know, um, training in intelligence, training in policing and all that. And sometimes when they retire, they need things to do. So I see this as an avenue to create jobs for them. We shouldn't miss that opportunity. We shouldn't miss an opportunity to actually, like I said, to legitimize an industry that is existing under the radar. 
we have private investigators in Nigeria now, and they, you know, they're employed by multinationals. They're contracted by embassies when they have to deal with issues of visa issuance and all that. They're employed by banks, by insurance companies when they're investigating insurance fraud, bonds, and all that. So they exist. So all we're basically saying is, look, if this industry exists, if these people are already operating, you have people involved in forensic investigations, and they go to court to give evidence. They fall within this and uh, this scope of private investigators. So. Give them a regulatory authority. Give them a law to regulate them, to guide what they're doing. And then, you know, let them pay tax to government rather than operating under the, under, under the way. Mm. So two things right quick, uh, Honorable. One, under which agency of government will it be? And secondly, one, under which agency of government will it be? Will it, and also, will it only be under the federal or state governments? And then secondly, what are the other issues that should be considered if this idea as you're talking about it, uh, if this idea is to see the light of the what are the issues that need to be considered critically? Okay, now this is something we're pulling from other countries. In the United Kingdom, it's a federal issue, national issue. In the United States, states have regulations specific to them. But what is general to all of them is two things, data protection and limitation of powers to operate to investigate. So it means that they have a limit to the things they could be involved in. So once you have done that, you know that they're working within a narrow boundary. And now you're asking which agency will regulate them. Now the security industry, the private security industry in Nigeria is being regulated by Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corp. And I think they should fall under their the purview. Hmm. Well, uh, then if it's going to be, so I, I hear you say on the one hand, it should be under the NSCDC, then you're also talking about the states. I want to understand. Yes, you see, I gave you two instances. I gave you the instance of the United Kingdom, which is a national one. I gave you instances of the United States where it's state by state. But then you have an existing federal regulation, but the states have a concurrent power to, um, to regulate. So you could have the same thing in Nigeria. I mean, I know that in 2022, you know, even then prisons were deregulated in Nigeria and that it was put under the concurrent list. Nigerian railway now, state can now be involved in licensing of railways and in, in, in power generation and all that. This were in the situation before. So you can have a similar situation in which the regulation of the private investigation industry is put at, on, you know, on the concurrent list. If you can take this in about 10 seconds, there's also the concern of need for balance of uh, transparency and uh, individual privacy rights. That's why you have the Data Protection Act. That's why, you know, if you regulate, then you can put them under certain regulation and ensure that they stay strictly. But now that they're operating without any form of regulation, so on which law will you use to prosecute someone who has violated um, privacy? None. Look at what is happening on social media. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's similar. Mm. Well, thank you so much. This has been quite elucidating for a number of people. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Honorable Adi Ogun is a former Deputy Chairman, House Committee on National Security and Intelligence. Appreciate your time. All right, let's see whether Business Morning on Sunrise Daily will protect your investments. Let's go there now. Very interesting now, it's actually Investor Protection Week um, next week, and the, we've been driving the conversations on that because at the end of the day, if you're going to invest, you want your um, principal actually protected so you can actually make profit and not lose all of it. Hello, welcome. It's a Friday trading day uh, right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Let's get to the top stories um, that set your agenda now. We'll see the oil market. There's still a lot of tension in the Middle East, and we see oil prices reacting to the upside, um, too. We see oil again, uh, Brent and WTI, uh, from a weekly loss um, uh, last week. We're, we're kicking off um, October with strong gains uh, right there with uh, tension in the Middle East, still you know, moving uh, investor sentiment. Uh, we see oil, um, that's Brent, um, $0.09 cents, um, up there, 0.17%. We're seeing um, both uh, benchmarks there leaving, moving farther away from the $70, um, $70 uh, range there. See, 0.15%, that's for WTI crude. Um, $77.73, that's Brent. So at the end of the day, we're seeing this um, upward movement for all prices. Um, definitely still on the back of 
um, supply disruptions. President Joe Biden said um, the U.S. is discussing strikes on Iran's um, oil facilities as retaliation for um, Tehran's uh, missile attack on Israel. The comments uh, contributed to a 5% rally in oil prices. And we see traders are feeling the heat, you know, with the heightened um, tension in the Middle East right now. So um, no space to play for the oil, oil uh, bears in the market. So we're seeing bullish sentiment, but maybe if there's some kind of de-escalation, maybe we'll see prices actually come back uh, down to uh, reality. Let's uh, get a check on the FX market now. We see that we're strengthening um, the FX market. That's uh, with the Naira. Um, yeah, it was 0.59%. Uh, um, job for NAFM, 1,659 Naira to the dollar. That was a, the, that was the close uh, for yesterday's uh, trading from 1,669 NAFX, 1,659. Uh, same same um, level there. Just uh, the Cobo uh, difference, 0.19 percent um, up. That's for um, NAFX, and definitely we see um, the central bank there. Uh, introducing an electronic foreign exchange matching system, that's uh, FMs, uh, for foreign exchange um, transactions within the Nigerian uh, foreign exchange uh, market. Uh, according to the CBN, the new system will be operational in the Nigerian foreign exchange market by the 1st of December 2024, after a two-week um, test run that's scheduled for November. In a circular signed by Dr. Omolara Duke, Director of the Financial Market Department at the CBN, the Apex Bank explained that the uh, that FMs is designed to improve governance and transparency in the FX market. And definitely everyone's hoping that this will lead to um, strengthening, you know, Naira at some point, you know, if we have all of that um, transparency and liquidity, definitely in the market. To other stories now, the federal government is introducing new tax incentives to attract Five to ten billion dollars in investment for deep water offshore um, oil and gas operations. This move is part of efforts to boost the sector and strengthen the economy. In a statement, uh, the special advisor to the president on energy, Mrs. Olu Verheiden, highlighted the package, which includes tax exemptions on diesel, compressed natural gas, and cooking gas, aimed at supporting um, key investments in the sector. Earlier this week, the finance minister, Mr. Wally Edu, announced that this is the first fiscal framework for deep water gas exploration since 1991. All right, let's look at other commodities now. The global price of rice has dropped to its lowest level in 16 years with prices um, last seen in 2008. And this is based on data from the um, Thai Rice Exporters Association. The price drop comes after India relax its export restrictions following an assessment of its domestic rice production. India, the, the key exporter to both Asia and Africa, has driven the sharpest decline in rice prices in over 15 months. Meanwhile, Africa remains a major importer of rice sourcing from India and Thailand. Uh, rice is a crucial staple, making up uh, around 60% of many diets across the continent. But we're not seeing that price drop um, right here in Nigeria. See, on a month-to-month -month basis, uh, rice still definitely up, right? They're over 100,000 are up at 50 uh, kilograms. All right, let's um, look at our first conversation now. Major issues impacting um, Nigeria now. We see inflation driven by rising energy costs, food inflation. Uh, but one thing seems to be a driver of both food and energy prices, insecurity. How does Nigeria crush um, this insecurity issue that's, you know, breeding oil theft and chasing farmers? away from the farms. Joining me now for this conversation, uh, we have Mr. Adebayo Adeleke, the founder of Rootwatch. Joining me right here in the studio, great to have you. Good morning, laddie. It's been, a, it's been great to be back here. Yeah, it's fantastic. <clears throat> uh, it's been a while, you know, you've been on the show and a lot has happened. Absolutely. And, you know, since last time you came, we've seen food inflation. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, it's tending downward, we're still seeing it, you know, elevated. Um, if you look at the data from um, last month, you see that uh, food inflation has actually has left that 40% level, which is good, but it's still elevated. Prices are still high you know, at this point. Then we see energy prices. We're seeing the whole talk about um, oil theft. And you know, looking at everything, you know, is the security situation improving in some kind of way in Nigeria? And if not, is, has Nigeria ever been this you know, insecure where it's affecting food and energy 
Oh, thanks for asking that question. It's quite a loaded question a yeah. bit. Uh, is Nigeria be this insecure? I, I would say with data, uh, I think yes, over the course of time. Because if you look at it, of course, we look back in time and say, like, you know what, we've never been this worse. But we've, ne we've never really looked into the data and all the factors affecting insecurity over the course of time. And oftentimes, what we're experiencing now is the inaction that has happened over the last 20 or 30 years. So if you look at it, as Nigeria, we've never been this insecure. We have been always been insecure. But this much, probably not. You know, it's all about, it's, you have to put it in context and in relative. But you've talked about, um, you know, food prices dropping. It's expected. You know, if you look at what's, global, what's going on globally, it's not only Nigeria alone. Most of the countries are reporting uh, inflation drop. The United States has dropped uh, in the percentages as well. And we continue to see these things actually cascade into different countries, both developed and undeveloped countries. But one thing still remains, insecurity is the bane of most of all our, you know, food, trying to move from food insecurity to food security. But one of the things, all the metrics, all the different domains that we've collected data over the course of time, security, insecurity rather, has ranked top one or two factors actually affecting either from food inflation, food scarcity, you know, food, uh, agricultural production or whatnot. Insecurity has always been, and you and I will talk more, I think we're in our pre-show pre conversation, I share some ideas with you, but I'd like to go into it and I'll share more, um, right. more insight. And, and, and definitely you, you have some um, yeah. data out that's um, root to watch, and you did break down you know, the risk level okay. in uh, some states, and you know, from this we see the likes of Bornu, Katsina, Kaduna, um, Niger, this too, they're high risk Absolutely. Uh, from Previous of 74 points to 83, that's what Borneo State mm -hmm. ranked 37. Um, not much for the month-on-month -month change, but, you know, this, this is showing, you know, how risky most of these states. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about this, this date. So, uh, September, on September 11, we did something that hasn't been done before. We produced the Nigeria Security Index, which oftentimes, and I'll tell you a bit, if you, the time allows me to, see, to, to tell you, why we actually arrive at this. Over the course of time, we have been kind of been on the receiving end of people kind of defining what Nigeria is from security point of view. But actually, you know, try not to be insensitive. Uh, we are bad, but we're not that bad, ideally. So we kind of look at what is the construct of security. Are we looking at security? And uh, in, what, in what lens, from what perspective have we been looking at security? Nigeria is not monolithic in any shape or form. You cannot subject the whole country of over 200 million to an action that only about less than 5% of the population is experiencing. And then you term the whole country as being infested with terrorism or different banditry or whatnot. So that's where we kind of look at it from the subnational level to be able to categorize what is really going on in Nigeria. We kind of look at that uh, magnifying lens and look at each state as, as we look at it. And Bono and Castina has been experiencing over the course of time. So what we did, we look at the last 10 years, you know, and to the month of June, by the way, that's how we did it. So that last, so we look at the last 10 years and we look at June 2023 to June 2024, what has really been going on. And we look at the ways of the, nothing is really static. It's very, you know, moving and very wavy in any shape, some kind of weird shape like that. But one thing that has been consistent with Bono State that we've seen with the, you know, Boko Haram, with banditry and whatnot is going on over there. So it's quite a reflective, you know, data is reality and this one is one of them. And we begin to see what's going on in Kaduna as well. I've seen historically, I mean, what we've been reported in the news, both primary and secondary data shows the same as such. And then Niger now. Very interesting, Niger is the biggest state in Nigeria and also is the farmland as well. So this thing is actually quite important as we continue to look at, you know, how do we move from food insecurity to food security? We have to look at, you know, the grains belt, the tuber belt of Nigeria, because if you look at Nigerian food system, it's based, it's tuber and grain based. So how is food, how is insecurity affecting the grain belt? How is food security affecting the tuber belt? And then you begin to see, you know, the, the data will start speaking to you. But and I remember when, uh, you know, yam, just, you know, tuber of yam, 
No, at some point, <laughs> so about really seven thousand naira, about seven thousand naira for one tube. Absolutely. And you know, when I was when one of these uh, sellers told me that price, I I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to buy it. You know, at this point, it's really expensive. Just one tube. How how much? How many of you know the family is that going to feed? Yeah, and, and, and we're seeing all of that. And one of our research, yeah. actually, funny enough, and I'll show you the story. One of our research, you know, in Yoruba traditional uh, marriage right is to provide forty two tubers of yam. To the to the bride's That's family. That's a fortune. It's a fortune. I actually became contentious in one family. Like, why will I provide you for the two tubers of yam when each of them is about seven thousand naira? You know what kind of? <laughs> it was it was very interesting when you look at those reports as we continued as we went to the field to gather those uh, those data. So it become contentious. Not only that, and at that particular that singular event actually not only tells us about how significant this food inflation price is. It really you know went as far as affecting some of our cultural uh, cultural norms as well. Right, so yeah. you know, those trying to get married traditionally, definitely the costs exactly. you know, of traditional marriage, exactly. you know, also rising because of this. Exactly. But you, you also looked at it from a national um, level that you took in the whole of Nigeria, not yes. just, you know, the sub-national level. And you did come up with this um, uh, score. I think the score was about uh, in the 20s, you know, region, if you can put that up for me. Uh, but these are other states, you know, yes. but on a national level, if you look at the national um, data, we see that there's been some kind of, you know, it looks good, you know, when you look at it, you know. Yeah, so, so, yeah, if you look at it. Yeah, at the national level. Yeah, exactly. If you look at the national level, we're, we're moderate risk. Moderate. If, exactly, moderate risk. Because you cannot tell me that people in Bono, they're experiencing the same reaction when it comes to the issue of insecurity to the people of Lagos. If what is going on in Bono happens in Lagos, it's a completely different uh uh, it will be a completely different scenario as we view Nigeria. So Nigeria in its own entirety, different state governors are tackling uh, uh, you know, insecurity differently. Jigawa, for example, they've been doing some marvelous work over there, how they've been able to actually employ the youths and employ the population and getting them into agriculture has actually lower uh, their, you know, their, their security risk. factor, exactly, security risk factor. And some other states as well, Cross River has been the lowest of all states as we continue to move the south Southwestern state, you know, with the with the institution of uh, Amoteko as well, but also there are some other programs as well that they are using. We call it the non-kinetic programs that are using. You know, as I as I explained to you over the course of time, is that when we talk about security in Nigeria, ourselves Nigerians and the world at large have been programmed to define security from uh, just uh, law enforcement and military perspective. But security is quite deeper than that because there are several expressions of security. If you look at it for national security, border security, economic security, energy security. There's so many expressions of security. But you really want to get to the bane of this whole thing, you have to look at it like, for Nigeria to really solve this problem of insecurity, the military and the law enforcement is the last, is the last stop. That all the MDAs in Nigeria, each and every one of them has what we call the line of effort, the non-kinetic line of effort that directly affects security. As I explained to you, the, uh, what is going on in Jigawa, Jigawa used something different to be able to tackle their own security, and they saw the result. Imagine all the MDAs now contributing in different, you know, affecting the economy, agricultural production, is it data production and everything. We begin to see the shift in how we term so what we see and the activities we see from the security perspective. And the last one, if there's still, after every MDA has contributed from their own non-kinetic uh, line of effort, anyone that is still hanging out there will call them radicals and let the military and the law enforcement go out there and wipe them out. That is how you affect security and how you improve security, either at the community level, either at the state and regional level and national level as well. Right, and you know, definitely, you, you did mention you know, the non-kinetic yes. uh, measures at this time, but it, it, talk to me about technology now. How much, how much technology is really playing into our security you know, at this point? And you know, we've been talking about funding, yes. funding, yes. You know, defense funding. Mm -hmm. We've heard some quarters say it's not enough. Some say we're spending a lot you know, when it comes to defense. So let me marry that, you know, technology and spending. So I'm glad you asked it. Uh, Root, uh, Root Watch, we've been working intensely uh, on the Root Watch intelligence side. And also in the upcoming weeks, we're going to be releasing the Food Security Index, the force from Nigeria, about how we view food, uh, food security. And what I can tell you, categorically speaking, I haven't been on the field for the last four months, 
uh, about both on the food security side and physical and community security side. Technology plays a huge role. Actually, I believe is the bridge, uh, 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 the bridge above troubled waters for us in Nigeria. For able for us to be able to tackle uh, security, all form of security, we need technology and. The basic form of it that we are lacking at this particular point in time is data. You know, we cannot, you don't, you know, you can't solve what you don't know. And that's it. it the moment you're solving what you don't know, you're actually being disingenuous to yourself and to the people you actually govern. And I don't think we actually have really sat down and look at security architecture, both from the national level to the local government level and all the all kind of levels in between. How are we using data? What do we know about security within our confines, within our government, within our communities, within our borders? There's so many good data. I can be shooting all kind of data to you right now. You'll be shocked. But we need data more than anything else. And the architecture that produces data is lacking. And I, trust me, I collect data on food and security on a day-to-day -day basis every single day. It's not cheap. Uh, trust me, like the Americans, you say, ain't cheap. You know, and, uh, and we have to invest more on it. If you really want to solve this problem, uh, oftentimes when you look at some of these issues, you would think, is it a feature or is it a bug? Because oftentimes you will always attack this thing as a bug, but when you look deeper, you're like, this, this is looking like a feature. You know, it's like this thing is rather done deliberately. So because the more data you have, the more people are informed. And the more people are informed, the more they're going to challenge what is, being, what, is, what is the status quo. And the more people challenge the status quo, they see the light. The more they see the light, you know, the more people you know, want more for themselves and more for their generation. Right. And that's where we are right now. That's the crossroad we find ourselves. And definitely, you know, it, it seems uh, most of the economic headwinds we're having, you know, right now, we're not able to sell as much oil you know, mm -hmm. as we should, because you know, we've heard the story about um, oil theft. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're making wins, yes. you know, with that at this point, because we're trying to ramp up production so we can, you know, getting more revenue and have some more oil to refine, you know, domestically. So a, a lot to unpack there, but we'll take a break now. Okay. When we come back, we're going to break um, all of that down. Still watching uh, Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, we're still looking at um, solving the security, insecurity uh, problem so we can have food security and energy as security. I still have with me Adebayo here, uh, helping me break down, you know, most of this data. So, you know, definitely it's one thing, you know, having data mm -hmm. and it's another thing using it. How can policymakers you know, make use of all this data and this you know, technology you have right here? Absolutely. So what data does is to give you the insight. Uh, the more you dig into it, the more you kind of probe the problems. You know, like I said earlier, uh, one of the, prob one of the you know, stages of you know, solving problem is, you know, what is the problem and, you know, how do I get here? And data gives you the insight of it. And what we've discovered, especially we're using this data to be able to shine light, you know, on this, you know, if we kind of break down uh, some of these uh, attributes that we use in calculating these indexes, we're now beginning to see what is actually causing this uprising. You know, like we did during the 10, 10 days of protest, we found out, I mean, some of the, in, some of the data uh, deep diving, you know, activities we did on data, we found out that a lot of it actually is based on food insecurity, you know, because people are hungry, you know, that's why a lot of people are quite easily enticed to go on the street and whatnot. And that- And we see uh, how that impacts um, our elections. Exactly, exactly. So you see how these things are so interwoven. So because of food insecurity affect fiscal security, because of that fiscal insecurity affect economic security, because that affect political security. See how all those human security expressions are all interwoven. That if you solve one, that uh, there's high probability that the other one will subsides. Which one should we attack first? Which food one is life. Say? Food is life because if you don't have food, you can't live. So anything else emanates from it. So if you can actually solve the issue of food security, for example, now one of the one of things you're going to see in the upcoming weeks when we publish the food security index is that in all states of Nigeria, there is no food storage that is owned by the state or the local government. So tell me, if anything happens to a particular state, how can that particular state survive or feed its citizen, or a citizen, rather, depending on how you're looking at it? You know, th those are the questions the governors, the leadership of these opportunity states are supposed to start looking at. How am I going to feed my population? You know, how do, I mean, if you cannot feed your population, then how do you energize economic activity in such state? What will now 
entice investors to come to your state if you cannot even feed your own state if your state is that prone to all kind of you know insecurity so these are the questions that data actually tells you i mean these are the answers that data actually you know gives you in the process of kind of finding uh, answers to some kind of problems so like you know back to your question using data to probe the problem and that problem is now given insight. What we are trying to do with RouteWatch is to present, using data to present the problem and let people behind us, coming behind us, like these are the problems. These are what causes these problems. You have the ability to solve these problems. These are the tools. These are the areas that you need to solve. You have the, you know, the financial buoyancy and whatnot to solve this problem. Let somebody else come behind us. You know, Once we've kind of express the problem and explain what the problem is to them let people that have the insight that can solve the problem come behind those such as the government the policy makers because these data should help the policy makers as well to be able to enact policies that favors different aspects of the problems being you know being discussed right so that is why we can use technology but again to collect data you need technology to collect data you know in different like for example i'm guessing collecting data is not cheap it's very, very expensive. If I begin to tell you, big as Nigeria. if I begin to tell you to collect data, daily data on food prices in Nigeria, in both formal and informal markets, categorically, I mean, without being conservative, rather, it's going to cost about 200 million every month, 200 million naira every month to collect data on all 36 states and the federal capital territory on both formal markets and informal markets and just getting the food prices because you need those numbers to be able to understand how the prices are moving the inflection in prices what is causing prices because funny you know when anything happens in nigeria either the dollar drops or rises or something happened the fuel subsidies or whatever the informal market the prices of food is the first thing that that gets that that gets that notification and people will feel it immediately actually it doesn't even it doesn't even last hours I think like these people have a WhatsApp group whereby they discuss this. I thing think they must have a group. I'm because, telling you because... But it's funny how that group does not reflect when prices should actually go down. Exactly. The prices don't go down as exactly. fast as they rise. So, exactly. But all of that information. So it, it, it's, it's very critical that we understand how these things are all networked, are all interwoven, because it, it gives us clarity of thought. So it, it is important. For example, I mean, I, I just share with you, 200 million Naira to collect food data on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. You really want to have data on how to solve some of these problems. So imagine a serious government will now look at it. It's like, how can I begin to help? How can I begin to use data to be able to solve some of these problems? These are kind of programmatic spending I have to do, some kind of allocation to be able to do that. And if we have, we are really sincere about our efforts to actually solve this problem. I think it can be done. It can be done. It can Definitely. be done. We yes. put aside a good chunk of money to actually Absolutely. collect you know, all of that data so that you can have something to, you know, actually work it. So, you know, you know, going forward now, what are you seeing for 2025? You know, when you've looked at all of this data, are you seeing improvement, you know, on the radar or, you know, looking at the body language, you know, of this um, government and also the, you know, non-kinetic, are you seeing security situation improving? Yes, in some areas. Uh, so if you look at what the military has been doing in the last six months, they really wrap up on the kinetic efforts. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that has taken out a lot of radicals. So I begin to, I, con I foresee that, but that particular traction continue to go, and that will kind of do it down. But that's just a bandage. Uh, over the last, you know, uh, you know, if you assess the the current administration, over the last twelve months, they've done significant dents from the kinetic point of view of, you know, kind of interdicting a lot of this stuff, you know, getting to the heart of some of these radical uh, communities and kind of disrupting them, they bring them to do that. The effect of that is yet to be seen in large scale of how do they gather, do they regroup and all those kind of stuff. So that is, con we'll continue to monitor that. For the last 12 months, we'll continue to monitor. And I foresee this going forward, they'll continue that trajectory because the military is really on their heels on that. But now the rest of the MDAs, I really do not, if they don't actually, you know, get the act together, because some of the solutions I see them proposing over the course of time, then it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm just being frank with you, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't show that they genuinely understand the root cause of some of these problems. And if we don't understand the problem, how can you solve a problem you don't understand? That's a question that I'm not trying to be complex in any shape or form. I'm just asking a simple question. How can you solve a problem you don't understand? So if the MDAs are not using their non-kinetic 
you know, line of effort from their own, you know, different ministries and agencies to solve security problems. The military will always be at the, you know, brunt end of it. People always begin to, they will continue to blame the military. Right. Because so until, uh, until I see different, uh, until I see a lot of actions from these MDAs, like genuine actions towards security measures, uh, okay. I think the status quo will remain the same. All right, so so much to unpack, um, definitely. And we'll also keep um, watching and checking out of this data um, coming out of uh, Roots Watch. Thank you so much, Adebayo um, Adelike, the founder of Roots Watch. Thank you so much Thank for you so much, helping Adi. us unpack all of this data. Thank you. All right. All right, so uh, let's look at the, you know, back to the markets. Let's look at the top gainers and losers of September. It was a good month, you know, for the stock market. Um, that's uh, September, you know, if you compare that to the downturn that we saw in August. So to the top gainers now, uh, we see uh, Burger Paints um, topping, that's for September, 47.55%. Uh, so if you invested in this in the beginning of, of September, then definitely uh, you've made a, a cool um, change there on your maybe 500 or 100,000 um, Naira investment. Then ABC transfer there, 47.44%, another 47% for um, a transact. Now to the top uh, losers there for September, that's if you put money in these ones, then you'll be down. That's multiverse, 18.16%, uh, international uh, breweries, 17.89%. Then we have the likes of Julius uh, Berger there, 17.89%. Um, down. That's for uh, the month of September. Let's look at the sectoral performance now. Which sectors shine? Um, looking at financial services. If you look at the sectors, you see financial services did um, uh, have a, a nice uh, move there. But if you're looking at it from the September, that's we're looking for the month of September. This was um, for yesterday. For September, we see the banking um, the banking counter did uh, do well in September. But we see uh, consumer goods 0 0.20 percent. Aha, uh -huh, there you have it. Key index performance, uh, NGX banking, 10% um, up. Oil and gas, 7%. And uh, insurance, that's financial services, um, trading with 1.36%. That's for the total performance. That's for uh, September. So um, this will guide you to know which sectors to key into for October, which one is going to take, uh, which one's going to get profit taking, or where uh, you might actually see um, cherry uh, picking. You can use all of this data. Uh, to find that out. Thank you so much um, for watching. I'll give you an update later at 1 p.m. That's on Business Incorporated for trading uh, at the hour. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. I hand things over now to the Sunrise Daily team. All right, welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, we're crossing over now to River State. The uh, Saturday will be a big day, whichever way, because at least there's bound to be some activity or the other. Well, earlier today, and I guess even up to now, some scenarios developing. Let's cross over to our correspondent, uh, Charles Operum, is out there on this to just give us some updates on what the current situation is. Uh, Charles, so. What is going on now in Rivers about the elections? Okay, Chamberlain. Um, right now, I'm within the premises of the People's Democratic Party's uh, secretary, and the chairman, Aaron Sikwemeka, has just finished briefing the press. A summary of what he said in his press briefing is that the People's Democratic Party are not going to be taking part in the election. Of course, we've said that before, but it gets more interesting. He enjoined every member of the PDP in River State to oppose the election, not to take part in the election, and of course, boycott the election. And then further, he went on to say that any attempt to announce any resolve from that election would be a call to anarchy and violence. So this was a seven-point press briefing by the chairman of the People's Democratic Party here in River State. He commended the River State Police Command for standing by the judgment of the, uh, the Federal High Court in Abuja, and you know, went on to say that nobody would be allowed to flout that judgment. So that is a summary of the press briefing by the chairman of the People's Democratic Party here in Liberty. That press briefing ended about five minutes ago, and that's why I was able to join right now. Chairman. Speaking about the police, who is the commissioner of police now? We understand that there was supposed to be a change. Has that happened? So, so it's interesting because by this time last week, 
the commissioner of police was P.P. Olasunji D.C. As of this moment, there is a level of uncertainty over who the commissioner of police in River City is. But it's interesting because this morning, when the spokesman, the spokesperson of the River Command released a statement, he added a picture of C.P. Olasunji D.C. in the statement that he released. That would suggest that they continue to recognize D.C. as the commissioner of police in the state. But when the PDP protested to the police command yesterday, they weren't received by DC. They were instead received by the deputy commissioner of police in charge of operations, DCP Adepoju Ulubenga. So, as of this moment, there is a level of uncertainty about who the commissioner of police and River is right now. I don't know if you can also tell us, because we understand that the governor was also holding a press uh, briefing this morning. Um, can you tell us if you have heard anything so far from that press briefing? I mean, the governor had a broadcast this morning. Uh, that broadcast ended a couple minutes ago. I haven't um, read through the details of that broadcast, but basically, you know, the, the snippets I've seen so far, uh, of course, the report is coming in, is that it hasn't come in already. It's basically that it's standing by the election, it's uh, insistence that the election will hold on, it will go on as planned, and it's calling on the people of the state we should not be frightened to come out to vote for candidates of their choice and to stand by their, you know, by their choices, their political choices. So that's basically a summary of the governor's uh, broadcast. It's a, a little bit lengthy, but it happened this morning about maybe 20 minutes ago. So I think the governor must have gotten up very early because we understand that uh, he was out there. I mean, we saw images of that as well trying to intercept uh, some policemen. I mean, there were reports that some policemen had gone there to take away election materials. What information do you have about that? Any update on it? So, yes, that information is correct. At about 1 a.m. today, there were reports that some policemen were at the River State Independent Electoral Commission where they attempted to forcefully breach the facility. Now, the governor, alongside his loyalists, including the likes of the chief of staff, uh, Edith Benjamin, Victor Okojumbo, Tokari Goodboy, Awajia Abiyan, these are loyalists of the government. They came there and they uh, successfully, you know, uh, ejected those policemen who tried to force their way into the facility. That happened at about 1 a.m. today. And immediately afterwards, they mobilized their people, their loyalists, who are there keeping watch. You know, I was there earlier this morning. They have canopies blocking one side of Aba Road directly in front of the River State Independent Electoral Commission office, which is, interestingly, almost opposite to the uh, 6th Division Nigerian Army headquarters. It's just directly opposite there. And they've been singing, dancing, chanting, keeping watch. I spoke to one, of, one or two of them while I was there, and they said they don't trust the police. So they are here to protect the research by themselves and to make sure that nobody takes them unaware. So that is happening right now as we speak. How is that going to play out? It'll be interesting to see how that plays out because we know that even for the other states that have conducted uh, local government elections, usually the police is there to provide security. Uh, does River State have any other uh, security outfit that can fill that role if the police is not wanted? So now we're leaving the realm of facts to the realm of conjecture. Yes, indeed, River State has other security agencies. There is the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Force. There is the Nigerian army who are there. I saw uh, soldiers there as well. Um, there is the ESCC, there is the immigration service, there is customs, and then there is the neighborhood watch and OSPAC, which are the local vigilantes. You know. um, I say this because the chairman of the River State Independent Electoral Commission, you know, came out to say that the police is not the only security agency that can provide security for this election. And that if the police do not provide security for them, then they will resort to looking for other security agencies to provide security. So he did not specify which security agency they would be using. But it's safe to say there is no love lost at this moment between the police and research. So, so the thing about that is this. The, the, the atmosphere there at the moment is tense, and I think it will be tomorrow because the governor coming out by that time in the morning, and of course, you know, he had these hangers on who were also at least towing the line, the narrative of what he was saying. He was talking tough. And then you just told us now that the Rivers PDP themselves also asking their members to go out there and oppose it. 
So you're going to have two sets of people, those who wanted to yep. hold and those who will oppose. Yep. And now we don't know what the police, what happens at that point in time. I, so how is this I, going to play? Because even you, you have to be careful of that day as well. I mean, I have to be even careful today because I, I was physically attacked myself when I got there. So I was saved by, by a very good boy who is a member of the assembly, loyal to the governor. So I already understand the tension. I'm, I have physically felt it myself. And you can only imagine what is going to happen tomorrow if the tension escalates, you know, beyond the level where it's at, at the moment. Now, um, yes, indeed, the people at the River State Independent Electoral Commission, this year are chanting, election must hold, election must hold, election must hold. They are determined to make sure that that election holds. They are, however, matched by those on this other side who are insisting that the elections will not hold. So it's a battle of wheels right now. They say they have a court judgment. We have seen that from the federal high court. This other side say they have a court judgment from the River State High Court, and that that is the one they are going to um, be going ahead with. Now, it boils down to the voter who wants to come out and vote tomorrow. All these are going to be adding to a level of tension here. Can they come out to vote, assuming without considering the election goes ahead as planned? This is a question in the minds of the voters. And this morning, I mean, after now, I'll probably be sampling the opinions of people on the streets of Portakot to find out whether or not this political tension is affecting them mentally with regards to the fear of coming out to vote tomorrow. Kimberly. All right. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Charles. And uh, do stay safe, as we will always tell you. Thank but you. I think thank be, you very much. Yeah, I, I think there'll be a number of scenarios that'll play out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You'll have those two groups who will be there. Mm -hmm. Of course, they'll be there with their thugs, so you should know. And then a lot of voters will not be out there to vote. And then very likely, you may have security personnel who will come there. And then in the interest of saying we're trying to maintain the peace, there might be tear gas, and then they might disrupt the process. And then, you know, the governor has said there will be results. The election will hold, and there will be results. So likely there will be results announced, and the rest, you can say, the courts. It will get to the courts, then they will now do their thing, and you and I will be watching. We'll be here to report all of them to you anyway, whichever way the pendulum swings. Well, we'll have to move on, don't we? I don't know. My body already, <laughs> I feel a bit of <laughs> tension already just <laughs> listening to Charles Oporum give the situation report in River State. And it, it's interesting, all of this is happening in the week that we've celebrated Nigeria's 64th independence. Is this what we really want to be celebrating? Is this how we're showing that we're maturing as a country. Well, why would not seem to be making a lot of progress in the area of politics? Nigeria certainly is making, making a lot of progress, taking giant strides in another area completely and entirely in the intellectual atmosphere, in the entertainment industry. Nigeria is showing that, you know, she's not going to wait for these politicians to get their act right. So this morning, we are switching gears to talk about something else, uh, financial literacy. And, and I know that this is something that is important to many people in this season, uh, talking about the economy and how things are not going great. But there are still people who are teaching you how you can make the most of it. And they're not just preaching to you. They're looking for entertaining, innovative ways to pass this message across. Tonight, I uh, beg your pardon, tonight. <laughs> understandable. <laughs> I, uh, understandable no problem, because a hard copy is coming up tonight, so watch out for that. But <laughs> this morning on Sunrise Daily, we have the pleasure of hosting Arise Ugo, who is, I mean, take a look at that, side for so eyes. Um, she's an author, author of the book Smart Money Woman, and also the producer of the series and the movie that has now come out of that a smart money woman. RSA, it's such a delight to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. So um, right now, this is where you are. You have finally produced the second series um, out. Is it a series or a movie? It's a series. Mm -hmm. So it started out as a book, a financial education book focused on African millennial women. So it tells the story of five girls and all their pain points when it comes to money and finances. But we make it fun. So I wrote the book, went on a Pan-African book tour across Africa to countries like South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya. And then people started saying, oh my God, I could totally see this as a movie. 
So I had the bright idea to turn the book into a TV series that went on Africa Magic and then Netflix. And now season two is coming on YouTube to a wider audience in October. Oh, YouTube. That was deliberate? It was mm -hmm. intentional? It is. It is quite intentional. It's a pivot in a different direction, but it's very scary, very risky, but I really think it's going to work because I think that YouTube has become one of the biggest streamers across the world. And it gives so much access, especially in times like this. People are not trying to pay subscription fees <laughs> you know, to watch things. They're trying to manage their um, dollars or their Naira. Um, so it's interesting putting it on a free platform that basically reaches millions of people, hopefully, to subscribe to Azua Studios on YouTube so that you can watch season two of The Smart Money Woman. Mm. Well, I have noticed, I mean, when you produce season one, I, I note, I follow you on Instagram and then I heard you chronicle the challenges you went through as an executive movie producer. <laughs> Did it get easier with the production of season two? All I can say is that with film, you learn the real entrepreneurship journey. Like it's almost like it's all happening at the same time. So you're dealing with obstacles like raising capital for film, trying to explain to investors that Nollywood is actually a viable industry because we don't have the same ROI that other industries like report, but we're growing. So it's about that, right? I had to learn how to write a script. <laughs> I had to learn the film production process, like hire really great teams from Nigeria and South Africa to basically like manage the process. But it is quite, you know, challenging trying to navigate all of that. And imagine we were doing it at a time where um, Naira was 500. By the time we finished producing, it's like a thousand, um, it's a thousand Naira, a thousand five hundred Naira. And it's, the costs were insane, for lack of a better word. Um, so basically navigating all of that and trying to get to the end of it was very challenging, but it's very exciting. We shot in three cities, um, Lagos, Johannesburg, Cape Town, because like you said, I really wanted season two to be so much bigger and grander than season one. Even if everyone loved season one, I hope that they are so excited with like the topics that we're um, de delving into in season two, whether it's financial abuse, whether it's the entrepreneurship struggle of raising capital in the creative <laughs> um, industry and what that means, whether it's discussing art as an investment um, in Africa. Um, and basically for me, what is so important is making all this financial education stuff that's typically so boring, very exciting. Mm. So um, could, could you tell us what kind of reception did you get? I mean, I, I know you, you spoke <laughs> a little bit about yeah. producing the movie. Yeah. But what kind of reception? How did they receive this? The responses you got? Oh my God. It? When it came out on Netflix in 2021, we were in the top 10 for over 12 weeks. Whoa. Um, and I loved like the response. You think that it's a, it's because it's such an unlikely idea. Yeah. Financial education as a film or as a series, I promise you, it was so tough to sell the idea. But I love that the audience loved it, and specifically because the characters are African. It's not just like theoretical stuff. It's putting their pain points in context. It's saying, actually, I can see myself in Adesua. I can mm. see myself in Lara. My older sister went through what Zuri went through. My I can, you know, whether it's men or women, people really responded to seeing basically relatable stories through the characters. So, uh, because I mean, when you talk about financial literacy, people will think, okay, what do I have to do? <laughs> okay, fine, I get this message. They think they can get it in just one fell swoop. Mm. But you have a series. Yeah. So how, how did you how are you approaching that? Basically, it's tackling all the little things that we think are so simple, but actually like affect our daily lives. So for me, financial education is not a get rich quick scheme. It's basically about understanding the future costs of, sorry, the opportunity costs of our present um, decisions on our future outcomes. Mm. So given this difficult economic climate, what are the things that we're doing now that are going to affect us tomorrow in, <laughs> in a year from now? People, 27% of people, Nigerians who have seen a decline in their income are now resorting to emergency debt. As long as we know that we have to survive and all of that, it's, it's quite important for us to have these financial literacy um, conversations so that we understand that, yes, debt is, can be used for survival, but we know how to manage it in the context of our own like limited resources. Mm. Thinking about how to basically make financial decisions, what kind of investment decisions should I be making in my own 
particular, you know, situation. So basically things like that. I mean, I know that sometimes people, yeah, humans are emotional, of course, yeah. but did you get any response in the area? For instance, if people tell you, look, if I have to imbibe and operationalize some of the policies and principles that you mm. put out there, people may perceive such persons as being quote-unquote wicked. <laughs> and not very realistic, but you're just being, listen, I need to just shut out my need for my greed or want, you all know, of those things. You have to be realistic. interesting, it. right? Because things like that were very previously taboo topics, like wills. <laughs> I'd have people say, oh my God, I tried to talk to my dad about a will years ago, and he's like, do you want to kill me? But after we watched that series together, he's now having more conversations oh. about, oh, actually, let's talk about this. What does my will look like. So what I love the most is how it's sparking conversation, it's sparking debates. I don't know everything. Everything that I'm putting in my book is basically strategies that I've learned from other people. I've garnered from life experience and all of that. I love that it's, it's so relatable, but I think that the most important thing that this work has done is sparked conversations, sparked debates about important topics. And we're all basically learning from each other because the more we have less shame about, whoa, I'm broke. <laughs> mm. The more we have less shame about how much are you earning? How did you negotiate your salary? Things get better. I think things get better when we have conversations about it. Well, I think one of my colleague usually talks about culture eating certain things for lunch. <laughs> so let's see how this plays out. Go ahead, Ayo. Well, maybe there's a culture around this money, I guess, that, you know, she's going to have to tell us. But there's something that I, like you said earlier that I, well, you said it kind of in passing. And I, I just stopped right there. We hear about drug abuse. We hear about sexual abuse. Financial abuse will be strange to some people. What could that mean? Seeing how it actually... It's interesting how it basically plays out in different forms, whether it's religious financial abuse, whether it's financial abuse in marriages, that firstborn syndrome. <laughs> I just saw something on Twitter now saying first daughter to first daughter, <laughs> like give yourselves advice. But the financial abuse that we don't talk about that is also like culturally motivated because of the part of the world that we're in. Mm. So what exactly is the, is the talk around that, you know, financial abuse? Chamber, you see, culture comes to play. So what exactly is this financial abuse about for those who have no idea what you're talking about? So one of the characters in the show called Lara is an oil and gas executive. She earns a lot of money and she has a huge family, but she's the breadwinner of her family. Her mom is a widow. She has siblings. And basically, no matter how much money she makes, the cost burden of taking care of her family is a lot of pressure on her. And it's that sort of situation where no one wants to hear you don't have money. You work in an oil and gas you know, company. But if your, your income is here and your expenses are here, you're just as broke as a person who earns less than you. And we, we're not talking enough about teaching families, okay, how do I teach the people around me how to fish? So that they're not completely dependent on me. Because if I don't put my own oxygen ma mask on and I fall and, or I lose my job or my business doesn't go well, who looks after them? So mm -hmm. having those conversations about putting in the book, I give an example of maybe the idea of putting money in a pot and, and holding everybody accountable for if you borrow money from the family pot, you have to put it back. Otherwise, the next person is not going to have you know, access to it. So basically just trying to make better decisions that are more sustainable, that don't guilt you into doing things today that puts everybody under pressure tomorrow. Well, you know, it, it's a very interesting dynamic, this thing. And, and I don't even know how you're able to, to, to cut it because um, economics is boring for some people. Even though it impacts a huge part of our lives, economics yeah. is boring. Uh, you know, talked about uh, financial literacy, and all, it's also boring. Even though... It uh, impacts our lives directly. Uh, I, I saw a, a clip where Mr. Femi Oterola was talking about the fact that, you know, he's, he started out very, very young at age six and all of that. Uh, in what way do you think this series you've made can help people to adopt some of this, the, the initiative, the strategies that have been taught, even to the little kids around them? Oh my God, I think that the series has done exactly that. By the time you put Osasi Godaro, Inidema, Tony Tones, Timini Egoson in a show, like you know that it's going to be 
very sexy, very fun, very exciting. But you're also, with season one, what I loved was that people really learned and they were teaching each other. Or if you go on YouTube, you'll see people who started their own book clubs or started their own basically communities based off of the book. It has nothing to do with me. It's how people related to the characters and the strategies that were in the book. I get emails every day saying, oh my God, I started budgeting better or I bought land or you know, I had, I've started having more financial conversations with my friends because women typically will talk about balancing being a wife and a mother, but we won't talk about our bottom lines. We won't talk about how we're reducing our cost burdens. We won't share strategies about like investment, you know, conversations. And I love that this is sparking that kind of um, change where it's cool to talk about your finances. Mm. You know, I'll ask this last one. With um, you, I say your book. Uh, uh, okay, just for a second. Uh, I'll ask this question. I know it's a woman to woman thing. Don't, no, no problem. But there is this uh, uh, clip that I saw uh, uh, by a woman, by the way, who said, Look, when a lady is broke, she goes to her man. The mother is broke, goes to her uh, the son and all. Who does the man go to? So you oh. made one for a <laughs> series for women now. Who's going to make one for men? Or isn't there something for men to learn from? What is so interesting? <laughs> you know what's so interesting? I love that Nigerian men are, you know, made to be the providers and all of that. But I think that if we actually really look at the statistics, there are a lot of women who are supporting their homes. They're just not vocal about it. Nigerian women are supportive very financially supportive of their husbands. And I think that if we're being honest, we'll look into many marriages and see how they're sharing the costs, they're sharing um, the investments, they're sharing the assets. Um, so I think it's a misconception that men don't have people to um, lean on, especially in marriage. Especially in marriage. <laughs> that, that's the key word. You know, single men will be wondering, well, what about us? You know, who, who looks after who us? Looks but after hey, us. if you're single, then you chose to be single, or maybe you didn't choose. But what I like, and what has been very interesting in the journey of producing Smart Money Woman, mm. is that you've been doing it in an economy where you know, things have changed drastically and you've had to leave out the lessons which you're teaching yes. others. So how has that worked out for you? Uh, looking at Nigeria today and Nigeria when you wrote the book, just <laughs> a very recent Nigeria, yeah. especially in terms of the economy. And I know it's not just Nigeria. I know mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, economies are also grappling, but looking at our own current circumstance, what advice would you be giving to young people, entrepreneurs, you know, especially in this season? Yeah, with food inflation at 40%, mm -hmm. astronomical rise in fuel, <laughs> fuel um, costs, I feel like it's difficult to give any like advice. We don't know what is going to happen. But I think that financial literacy or financial education gives us the tools to be able to navigate this. So for me, the biggest thing now is having clarity about where my money is going. I, I've gone from spending 12K a week um, for petrol in my car to 80K. How do you navigate that? That's not something that you see coming, but it's about seeing, okay, where is it all going now? And how do I cut costs in the, in the places that I can cut costs? And how do I increase my income despite all the um, difficult economic talk? Um, it's tough. I think rich or poor, we're all feeling the pinch. The cost of living is costing. <laughs> so I, I got one question more for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the big picture? What do you see? What do you want to achieve at the end of the day with this? Oh my God, I want it to be, I want Smart Money to be a Pan-African brand on a global stage. I want our stories to tell a different story about African women. I, I think that right now, Africa, Africa, when you think about Nigeria, we're always selling the poverty story, the corruption story, but there are nuances to how we live. They're more cosmopolitan women. They're more intelligent women. It's not just, oh, we don't have anything in Africa. We have so much talent. And I want us to showcase that. I think that film is a very powerful tool for changing narratives and perspectives and, you know, culture. And we think America is the greatest um, country in the world because they've told us that through their films. We think LA is so glamorous because we've seen it in films, but we don't talk about their homelessness problem. We think Paris is so romantic, but we don't talk about how dirty it is. <laughs> Nigeria, if we continue talking about, if we continue creating content that only focuses on corruption and all the bad things that we have going on, and we don't tell them about our food, 
We don't tell them about our music. We don't tell them about the other ways that we're living, um, how talented we are, how the average Nigerian, in spite of all these problems that we're talking about, they eat problems for breakfast. Mm -hmm. We're resilient. Mm -hmm. like, so I want to create content that basically showcases that brilliance, that showcases what it means you know, to be Nigerian, especially a Nigerian woman, and change that narrative on the global stage. All right. I mean, uh, we'll have to anchor at that point. <laughs> I, I suspect that I have a certain Ayo Makinde who may like to do a script for you, because you always see movies <laughs> in everything we do me. every morning. He sees movies all over the place, but Arase Ogo, thank you very much. Thank and all you the best so much to you for having me. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so there you go. That wraps it up today. We do thank you all for watching. We'll see you again next week. I'm trained by Lunasa. Goodbye. We sincerely hope we've been able to leave you optimistic and give you another perspective to look at things from this beautiful Friday. I'm Mao Kweogun Yusuf. Thank you for watching. And in case you don't have or make time to relax, go see a movie. Oh, well, there's one on YouTube. Amaya Makide, you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Have a wonderful rest.